back down. This was that snowstorm during the committee. Actually didn't go into work that day. Oh. It's easy because Mars' whole beginning of the life, I was on the committee, so it's easy yeah. to kind of <laughs> know what I, the time. Us at the Capitol. So I, my Jazz came to visit me one day after a deposition. Mm. Set the Easter egg roll. So, interesting story about this. I went to the Easter egg roll, and then actually that's the morning that we did the deposition of Caroline Edwards. So that kind of highlights the blending of trying to be a dad and a husband. Uh, lucky enough to have, you know, Mr. Thompson gave us tickets to the Easter egg roll, went in the morning, and then came back into the deposition of Caroline Edwards at 10.30 that morning. So it was like really juggling uh, family and, and job. Uh, more pictures of Mars at the Easter egg roll at the White House. I think this is just like one of those great pictures of coming home and just throwing ball at Mars. Uh, another picture of us at the White House during the investigation as a family. Uh, I like to joke that Mars has been in the White House more in two years than I had ever been in my life, right? It's kind of one of the cool perks of it. Um, for the first primetime hearing when I did the attorney statement, just some behind the scenes pictures of before filming. That's our deputy comms director. Um, and that was how we, we filmed. The, and this the was first. one of the first times you'd ever done something like this. This was the first time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a video in the Air Force, like a recruiting video. This was the first time I had done an interview where it was just a Q&A and I was having to kind of describe what we had found on the on the committee. Was it daunting? It was, um, so we recorded the same week as the first hearing. So we recorded, I think, on the Monday or Tuesday before the Thursday hearing. And so I think it was honestly too tight for it to be daunting. Mm -hmm. It's like, we got a job to do. Yeah. This hearing is coming up in 72 hours. And so we got to film and knock so this thing out. So you had 72 hours to put all of that together. Well, the beauty of it is I had already done that part of the investigation. So it wasn't really like putting it together. It was really just how do you convey this in the most simplest terms. Um, and uh, it came together pretty quickly. I mean, you wrote the scripts at a coffee bar. <laughs> uh, I did a lot of my writing on the committee, whether it be the script for a hearing or the report itself at a local Alexandria coffee bar. I found that to be like the most peaceful place where you kind of get away from the noise of the Capitol and be in your sweat clothes and kind of get in your creative space to be able to write. And they had no idea that somebody was making history in the corner. They still over have a cup no of coffee. idea, no idea at all, but their coffee was great <laughs> and I probably owe a lot of the work to the coffee at that shop. <laughs> yes, this is the night before the first hearing where we're going through a, a prep for the following day and that's one of my colleagues and I were um, pretending to be one of the witnesses. So I was pretending to be Caroline Edwards and he was pretending to be Nick Quested. Mm. As you can see, I have my mask on at all times, um, even during the prep, but I found it to be one of the cooler uh, experiences was you know, going through that last run through of the entire hearing to make sure that everything was, was tight. And this was actually my office mate, so you know, shared a cubicle with them and everything. And so uh, we worked on that first hearing together and that's us now role playing the two witnesses. You were in a government building, a secret space. <laughs> where? <laughs> yes, yes. We, our, our office was not in one of the traditional uh, office buildings that you think of, of course, for safety concerns. Um, but of course, when we were starting to have the, the actual hearing prep, we were in, in the room, right, in the Cannon Caucus Room, mm -hmm. a very historical room within Congress, uh, doing the run-throughs and, and making sure that all of our facts were tight. You uh, needed to know what it, what it felt needed, like to be in that space. You needed to know what it felt like in the space. The members needed to see you know, what the space would look like, where the witnesses would be compared to where they were sitting. Mm -hmm. This is actually a picture of me the morning of that first hearing with Mr. Raskin, Congressman Raskin, who uh, that, was my congr that was my congressional law, my uh, constitutional law professor from uh, mm -hmm. American. Um, really cool to be working with him on this. Uh, that was our badges for the first day so uh, Jasmine was able to come to the first hearing and so I took a picture of our badges. 
picture of me with Congressman Spamberger. I'm a proud Virginia kid, and so taking a picture with her, and this is probably the one that I, I love the most. Um, I love Congressman Benny Thompson. He's a hero of mine. As I said, my grandmother made me watch C-SPAN all the time, and he was doing the good work back when I was a younger child, and so being able to work with him and, and give him my thoughts and opinions, and he listened so intently and actually you know, act on what I, the advice I was given, I thought this picture was just like a clear representation of the relationship that we developed over the, that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's someone who I just have tremendous respect for and love for and loyalty for the way that he carried himself on the committee, not as a Democrat, not as a Mississippi man, but as you know, the chairman of a bipartisan committee that wanted to just find the facts. It's me with Caroline Edwards. Um, she was one of the first witnesses that I met and she bravely told her story of how she fought the rioters at the Peace Circle when they first broke through at 1253 on January 6th. Of course, when you're... She's now a sergeant. She's now a sergeant, recently mm -hmm. promoted. Um, was really happy for her, still happy for her. And I think when you're working with someone for such an extended period of time, you learn more about them than just like the facts of that day. Like, mm -hmm. I know she's a proud Georgia Bulldog, right? And, <laughs> and um, I think you just develop a friendship with these folks to the point whenever I'm on the hill, you know, I'm, I'm calling her like, hey, where are you working just so we can catch up? Yeah. Um, definitely an American hero, and I don't say that lightly. She's definitely a, a hero from that day and, and someone I'm glad to be able to call a friend. I always like to show these pictures of just how crowded the mm. hearing rooms were. Yeah, you couldn't really you tell couldn't from really what tell. you saw on television. Yeah, so that was me in the back corner of the hearing room. You can see the staff on our mm. phones on the side and the press and then those are congressional members and staff that are there to watch. But it was, I mean, standing room only for every hearing that we had. What did it feel like to be in that space as these hearings were taking place? It was heavy. It was intense. You could feel the intensity with every hearing. You knew that millions of Americans and millions of people around the world were watching each hearing. And I think that we wanted to make sure that um, we were presenting the facts as we found them in an appropriate manner to the world. And so you could feel the intensity of just wanting everything to go perfectly. And um, then you take a deep sigh at the end of each hearing, uh, celebrate for about 20 minutes, and get right back at it get for the right next back one. back at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this was a real family affair. Real family affair, 4th of July. We got a little break. Uh, we didn't have hearings that week, of course, and Mars was all about his American flag, still is, wouldn't leave the house without his American flag for 4th of July. <laughs> so this is the picture I was telling you about for the last primetime hearing, when I was sitting on the dais next to Mr. Kinzinger, Ms. Lofgren, Ms. Cheney's actually, um, were next to Mr. Kinzinger, but wrote that hearing with Mr. Kinzinger and, and Ms. Loria. Um, it was the 187 minutes hearing where we talked about, you know, the dereliction of duty where the former president didn't act as commander-in-chief to protect our country from the attack on the Capitol. And I found it to be extremely powerful to have an Air Force officer, Mr. Kinzinger, like me, um, and then Ms. Loria, a retired Navy officer, be the folks that led that hearing. Um, Mr. Kinzinger and I talked about it all the time, what it, was, what it is to be an officer uh, in the Air Force. And for him to be able to deliver the arguments and the facts of that day, I think just made it even more powerful. So that was from the rehearsal that morning uh -huh. uh, before the final 187 minutes. And as you can see, uh, Mr. Kinzinger and I were both uh, masked, up. masked up. It was, the, it was the height of COVID, right? So, and I had a baby at home and he had a newborn as well. Uh, and so we were both real careful about not taking anything home to our children. And Ms. Cheney, I mean, we, we ran through the entire hearing. You can tell we had the same intensity during the run through as what we had during the actual hearing that night. You also told us that, that part of the reason why you had that mask on is because it, it was protecting your, your emotions. <laughs> yes, I'm not the best at times at hiding my face. I don't necessarily have a poker face at all times. And this hearing had nothing to do with me. And I think the mask gave me a comfort that I could just look straight into the audience. And if I did make a face of some sort, it wouldn't become the story because the story was the work that the members were doing and, and, and the facts that we were putting for, for the world to see. This is a, actually a pretty special picture. Um, these are 
two of our best friends from George Mason. Officer Lazama, Detective Lazama, is actually with the Metropolitan Police Department. He's a DC native, Duke Ellington alum, super proud of it. Um, and, and he actually fought on the West Plaza on January 6th. And I actually remember, you know, we talk about on January 6th hit home. Um, his wife is actually my wife's line sister. And we were talking at the time of how nervous we were for, for Pedro to be going down to fight. But um, talk about being a proud friend. Um, and so it was the least I could do for him to be my guest for the last hearing about the actual attack on the Capitol. And I know that having talked to him after the fact, I think it provided some closure for him to be able to see how his actions were um, represented during this congressional hearing. He's smiling in that photo. Yeah, yeah. How is he post January 6th? We know this I, I, was really hard for so many of the officers mm -hmm. that, that you, you talked to and that told their story. So I, I think Pedro is representative of a lot of the officers we talked to where they were processing and he's processing that day, um, more so acutely than any of us who weren't there with the violence. Uh, I think in, in a good story, we have been encouraging Pedro to, to make that leap to being a detective, getting off the, off the street beat and being a detective. And uh, if January 6th had any positive, uh, it was, you know, Pedro decided it was time to have a kid and to be a detective. And I'm happy to say he is a detective now. So he's not on the street beat anymore where mm -hmm. a lot of the officers who responded that day were, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, he's smiling, I think, because as he said, one, I think he was proud of the fact that he had a friend that was looking into the facts from that day, but also because he was able to find some closure. So this is a picture of some of my teammates and I uh, in the war room right before the final hearing. Um, those are actual scripts in front of them. As you can see, the fact checking of scripts never ended. So all three of those are my three lawyer teammates, guys that I was in the trenches with every single day. Um, incredible lawyers and we're literally just going through the script one more time just to make sure there's no typo no misstatement and this is just like an hour or two before the hearing uh, you've taken to calling the attorneys involved in this process the avengers <laughs> yes uh, i mean avengers super team whatever i mean incredible group and I can only hope that one day I'm surrounded by attorneys that are just as talented as the group that I was on. I feel that way at my firm. That's why I love the firm I'm at right now. But these these guys were and, and women, they were just incredible lawyers. I met some of my best mentors on this committee. Um, one is a, is, a, is a deputy attorney general here in DC right now, Candace Phoenix, a, a black woman who is just, I can't even describe how amazing she is as an attorney, as a person, as a DC native who truly cares about um, our democracy, uh, but an amazing team of lawyers from various backgrounds and it just made the work that we did that much more compelling. This experience changed your life? A hundred percent. I mean, it's both amazing and awkward. And I, I, I don't use the word awkward lightly, right? It's amazing because if you would have told me even in law school, the things that I would be doing right now, I would have laughed at you. Uh, and it's awkward because I'm starting to see the importance historically of the work that we did. And at the end of the day, I think I still view myself as just like that football playing son of a military guy back home. And so the fact that like I've done this type of work can be awkward at times because of how amazing the experience has been. Did it take Mr. Thompson and Ms. Cheney telling you you're not that person anymore <laughs> to help you understand this full circle moment that you're having? If there's one thing about Mr. Thompson and Ms. Cheney is that they definitely voice their appreciation for our work. Mr. Thompson in particular was always invested in making sure that I knew um, what I was capable of doing and making sure that I pursued that even after the committee and he's still one of my biggest mentors and supporters to this day. Mr. Raskin has been that for me since law school. Um, and so that's why I say I'm teaching my son how to dream, but I'm also learning how to dream myself right now. Um, and um, I'm really excited to see where it goes and, and, and how, this, how this plays out.